It's almost like a 500 piece jigsaw puzzle. Because there was no Italy as a country, there was no Germany as a country. It was all a bunch of small city states or uh, papal states or uh, monarchies, but divided into so many little pieces. And these composers, they were always trying to win the favor of the powers that be in any one of those places. So they're constantly on the move, trying to create their own network, their own alliances, things like that. Uh, and when you think about that, and what it was like to travel in those days, you know, the fastest thing was, of course, in Paris. So, you know, maybe you could go 10 miles a day. Uh, but I just want to read to you some of the places that these composers traveled to, starting with uh, the, the earliest composer, uh, Fra Francesco Gasparini. Uh, he was very restless. He was constantly moving between Rome, Venice, Bologna, back and forth um, throughout his life. By the way, Gasparini was the person who really um, turned the Ospedale de la Pietà, which I'm going to talk about more soon into the uh, internationally renowned musical conservatory that it was. And he was the one that actually hired Vivaldi to work there. Uh, Giovanni Porta, who was born in 1677, he traveled uh, from Venice to Rome, to London, back to Venice, to Naples, to Milan, and then to Munich, where he spent um, almost 20 years. Uh, in Munich, uh, and he was in London in 1720 for the premiere of, of one of his operas. Uh, Vivaldi himself was born in 1678, uh, traveled, uh, he, he loved to travel from Mantua to Rome, Venice, Trieste, Prague, Verona, Tacoma, Reggio, Ferrara, Amsterdam, and finally he ended his life in Vienna. Um, where he was seeking a new patron. He had been fired for about the third time from the Ospedale um, and thought he would uh, win some favor in Vienna, but unfortunately that fell through and he, he died in Vienna uh, penniless. Not because he was poor, but because he spent a lot of money very extravagantly. He had a large entourage that travels everywhere. Um, the next composer, Gaetano Battila, was considered the most influential Italian opera composer of his time. Um, and he lived until well to Mozart's maturity. He traveled from Naples to Rome, to Venice, back to Naples, and back to London, uh, where he spent a lot of time there. And the latest composer on the program, Giuseppe Sarti. Um, he uh, traveled from Fianza, Bologna, Venice, spent 20 years in Copenhagen, where he wrote operas in Italian and Danish. Venice, London, Milan, and eight years in St. Petersburg, where he founded the St. Petersburg Conservatory of Music. Um, so that's an incredible amount of travel by these five composers, which spans you know, over 150, about 150 years of history. Now, one wonders you know, why travel so much. And part of it was because they had to make a living that way. But the other part was that Italian music was the rage throughout Europe. Everyone wanted Italian composers in their city. Uh, and it got to the point where, for instance, in London, composers like Charles Avison, you know, they just adored Corelli. 
developed Jim Nair and others. Um, but at the same time, it created a lot of jealousies among the composers of various other countries, so that there was always this kind of uh, intrigue going on. You know, don't want the Italians, or you want to kill the Italians, get rid of them. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So, you know, it was this kind of a diaspora of Italian musicians all through Europe. Uh, and surprisingly, even a country like Germany, where the style of music during the Baroque era was so different than the Italian style, uh, that Italian composers were really involved there. In fact, Bach loved the music of Vivaldi, even though it was so different, and took many of Vivaldi's concertos and rearranged them for various other instruments. So it just kind of shows that someone like Bach was perhaps even the greatest composer that ever lived. You know, as an amateur of the music of Vivaldi, you can imagine what the, the, the general topic is like. Right. At the same time, composers from around Europe came to the Italian peninsula, but it wasn't so much to spread their style of music, it was really to absorb the kind of music that the Italians were writing. In fact, you know, one of the greatest composers of that era, George Frid Friedrich Handel, born in Germany, spent most of his life in London, but wrote in a very Italian style. In fact, a lot of his operas are in Italian. So it kind of goes to show the popularity of that music. So that, those are the two things so far. I mentioned there are three things that all these composers have in common. Now, the third thing was that at one time or another, all of these composers were employed by the Ospedale de Musica, and that is the focus of our program tonight. Now, the Ospedale de Musica. How many of you have ever heard of that institution before? Okay, a few of you. It was founded in Venice in the 1400s, and the reason for it was that Europe had just experienced one of their um, plagues, and uh, there was a lot of famine, a lot of illness, a lot of poverty. And the Venetian government wanted to set up a way to systematically help all of these impoverished, ill people. So they set up four different what they call ospedale, which I guess is a, you know, you could say translated into hospital, but they were only hospitals. They were orphanages, convents, um, schools, you know, anything that, that was needed to support this, this poor population. Over the course of the next couple hundred years, um, each of these ospedali developed a music program, started with the singing. And the reason for it was that it helped them raise money so that they could be self-sustaining. Little by little, over the course of time, uh, as part of the education for the, uh, the infants that were left there, uh, children growing up, um, they developed these music programs along with other trades to the point that these, the four ospedali in Venice were competing with each other to see who could be the best. Because of course when you're the best, you get the most contributions. Now, the conditions of these um, institutions were somewhat severe, but they provided excellent educations. Um, they provided trades, they provided nourishment, lifelong. And the way it worked was uh, if a parent was unable to 
support an infant. They would go up to the hospital, probably usually at night, and there was a little opening in the wall called a scafeta, and they would place their infant in the scafeta, and then it was kind of a, like a rotating tray. And the nun inside would accept the child. And the reason they did it anonymously like that was to avoid the humiliation of a parent having to leave a child like that. Um, but then the, the child would be raised and given the education they needed and the training. Uh, and I mentioned something. One of the musicians from the orchestra, Dal Hansen, recently went to the cathedral that's next to the Ospedale de la Pietà in Venice to see the museum there um, that was set up for, um, for, for tourists, of course. And he told a really interesting, pretty poignant story about how that worked, which was that when the parent left their infant, uh, at the institution, they were provided with a kind of a token, a wooden token, and it was broken in half, and it kind of fractured in certain lines. And the parent would get one half, and the institution would keep the other half in a file, so that if the parents ever wanted to reunite with their child. They would bring the token and fit together. They would know that um, it was it was meant to be. Um, so it's it's very poignant. Yet, what's amazing is that by the end of the 1600s, the Ospedale de la Pietà had one of the greatest orchestras in all of Europe and it was all female. Uh, there is a wonderful video that I just watched this past week um, called Il Diario di Chiara, or Chiara's Diary. Now Chiara was one of the infants that was raised uh, in the Ospedale. And she spent her entire life there, and she became one of the greatest violin virtuosos in, in all of Europe. Many people have concertos for her, including the ball. And the one you're going to hear tonight um, was written for her. Now, along the time timeline here, Vivaldi was hired in about 1703, 1704. Chiara was born in 1718, and Valdi left um, Venice in 1740, which means that these concertos that he composed for her, she was just a teenager. Um, and it kind of shows you the kind of virtuosity that she had. Now, one of her teachers was another um, inhabitant of the Ospedale, named Anna Maria. And she was born in 1689, so she was a teenager even before Vivaldi got there. And she too became one of the great virtuosos in Europe. And many, many composers wrote concertos for her. Vivaldi wrote at least 28 concertos for Anna Maria. Now, I've been calling these composers by their last name, and I've been calling these, uh, the, these women virtuosi uh, by their first name. And it's not because I'm trying to be disparaging, it's because they had no last name. They were left there as infants, and that was it. They just had their first name. So Anna Maria was sometimes referred to as Anna Maria de um, In other words, they, their last names were the instrument they played. Um, one of the interesting things about this all-female orchestra was that people came really all from all over Europe 
to hear this orchestra. They perform all the time, you know, all the time inside the cloistered, cloistered walls of this institute. And because of the worries of the day, they were not allowed to be seen. So they played behind uh, an iron, a wrought iron grill. Um, and the audience, because of what, it was a religious institution, they were not allowed to applaud. They could only express their gratitude and appreciation either by clearing their throat or shuffling their chairs. Um, and the reason we know this is directly from Kiara's diary. Uh, she talks about these things. Um, and she also talks about the various composers who worked there. And her favorite really was Vivaldi. And you know, you'll hear this concerto. Uh, it's extremely demanding. And what she wrote was, this concerto is difficult and also like my character. Uh, she was quite, sounds like quite the rebel. And I think that's one of the reasons why Vivaldi liked writing for her. Uh, she, Vivaldi was sometimes called the red priest. It's because he had red hair and because he had taken vows of priesthood, though he never said mass or anything like that. Uh, and Chiara said that his orchestra, uh, the girls were called the red priests, red girls, because they all wore red tunics, and she, she took quite a bit of pride in that. Later in life, uh, she wrote something which I thought was very profound, because the, Throughout her entire lifetime, there was only one day where she was outside the walls of this institute. And you know, she, one of the things that she loved was she could breathe the fresh air. She could see people living their daily lives. Um, it was this one breath of freedom she had, but then she had to go back and spend the rest of her life behind those walls. And later in life, she wrote, each note is a little tear of feeling in a great fluid highway, like the Grand Canal, with a very poetic and kind of expressive. Uh, the other by, uh, virtual survivalist, Anna Maria, um, I mentioned how wonderful she was as a violinist and how many composers wrote for her. She's also apparently an unbelievable teacher and Vivaldi's primary disciple. But she also played the cello, mandolin, oboe, lute, the yerba, harpsichord, and viola de Um So you, you can just imagine you know, what this orchestra was like back in those days and the kind of musical vitality it had. In fact, one of the rules of the hospitality was that the girls could leave for good and get married at the age of 20 if that's what they wanted to do and they would be provided a little dowry. But the one condition if they left the hospitality was they could no longer play music. They were not permitted to play music. And as a result, Either a lot of the women stayed there for their entire lives, or some of them that left came back because they just couldn't bear being away from the camaraderie and the music that they, that meant so much to them. Now, beginning tonight's program, and I think it's probably around 7:30 now, five more minutes. Uh, beginning tonight's program is a symphonia by Vivaldi. And even though it's the first piece on the program, it's the very last composition he wrote for the Ospedale. Um, and it's just so filled with light. To me, it kind of shows the affection that he had for his women's orchestra and the life of the music of Venice. 
So that's about all I wanted to talk about. Uh, we do have a few minutes left, and if any questions, be happy to answer them. Yes? Um, well, the orphanage lasted 300 years, or close to 400 years, really. Um, so I would say probably thousands. And there were also boys there, but they were segregated, and they were, in, they were taught trades, and they were actually sent out as apprentices. So it's somewhat, somewhat different. Um, if there aren't any more questions, I'd just like to say, the two young ladies who are performing for the Ball Day to Cheer Us tonight, um, Anna Maria and Chiara, uh, are two former students of mine, and it gives me a great deal of pride and gratification to see you know, my former students play so beautifully and continue this incredible tradition of great music that we're going to get tonight. So with that, we'll see you very soon and enjoy the concert. Thanks.